reply to the address of welcome at Madras. When the Swami Vivekananda arrived at Madras, an address of welcome was presented to him by the Madras Reception Committee. It read as follows. Revered Swamin, on behalf of your Hindu co-religionists in Madras, we offer you a most hearty welcome on the occasion of your return from your religious mission in the West. Our object in approaching you with this address is not the performance of any merely formal or ceremonial function. We come to offer you the love of our hearts and to give expression to our feeling of thankfulness for the services which you, by the grace of God, have been able to render to the great cause of truth by proclaiming India's lofty religious ideals. When the Parliament of Religions was organized at Chicago, some of our countrymen felt naturally anxious that our noble and ancient religion should be worthily represented therein and properly expounded to the American nation and through them to the Western world at large. It was then our privilege to meet you and to realize once again what has so often proved true in the history of nations, that with the hour rises the man who is to help forward the cause of truth. When you undertook to represent Hinduism at the Parliament of Religions, most of us felt, from what we had known of your great gifts, that the cause of Hinduism would be ably upheld by its representative in that memorable religious assembly. Your representation of the doctrines of Hinduism at once clear, correct and authoritative not only produced a remarkable impression at the Parliament of Religions itself, but has also led a number of men and women, even in foreign lands, to realize that out of the fountain of Indian spirituality, refreshing draughts of immortal life and love may be taken so as to bring about a larger, fuller and holier evolution of humanity than has yet been witnessed on this globe of ours. We are particularly thankful to you for having called the attention of the representatives of the world's great religions to the characteristic Hindu doctrine of the harmony and brotherhood of religions. No longer is it possible for really enlightened and earnest men to insist that truth and holiness are the exclusive possessions of any particular locality or body of men or system of doctrine and discipline or to hold that any faith or philosophy will survive to the exclusion and destruction of all others. In your own happy language, which brings out fully the sweet harmony in the heart of the Bhagavad Gita, the whole world of religions is only a travelling, a coming up of different men and women through various conditions and circumstances to the same goal. Had you contented yourself with simply discharging this high and holy duty entrusted to your care, even then, your Hindu co-religionists would have been glad to recognize with joy and thankfulness the inestimable value of your work. But in making your way into Western countries, you have also been the bearer of a message of light and peace to the whole of mankind, based on the old teachings of India's religion eternal. In thanking you for all that you have done in the way of upholding the profound rationality of the religion of the Vedanta, it gives us great pleasure to allude to the great task you have in view of establishing an active mission with permanent centers for the propagation of our religion and philosophy. The undertaking to which you propose to devote your energies is worthy of the holy traditions you represent and worthy too of the spirit of the great Guru who has inspired your life and its aims. We hope and trust that it may be given to us also to associate ourselves with you in this noble work. We fervently pray to him who is the all-knowing and all-merciful Lord of the universe to bestow on you long life and full strength and to bless your labours with that crown of glory and success which ever deserves to shine on the brow of immortal truth. Next was read the following address from the Maharaja of Khetri. Your Holiness, I wish to take this early opportunity of your arrival and reception at Madras to express my feelings of joy and pleasure on your safe return to India and to offer my heartfelt congratulation on the great success which has attended your unselfish efforts in Western lands, where it is the boast of the highest intellects that not an inch of ground once conquered by science has ever been reconquered by religion, although indeed science has hardly ever claimed to oppose true religion. This holy land of Aryavarta has been singularly fortunate in having been able to secure so worthy a representative of her sages at the Parliament of Religions held at Chicago, and it is entirely due to your wisdom 
enterprise and enthusiasm that the Western world has come to understand what an inexhaustible store of spirituality India has even today. Your labours have now proved beyond the possibility of doubt that the contradictions of the world's numerous creeds are all reconciled in the universal light of the Vedanta and that all the peoples of the world have need to understand and practically realize the great truth that unity in variety is nature's plan in the evolution of the universe and that only by harmony and brotherhood among religions and by mutual toleration and help can the mission and destiny of humanity be accomplished. Under your high and holy auspices and the inspiring influence of your lofty teachings, we of the present generation have the privilege of witnessing the inauguration of a new era in the world's history, in which bigotry, hatred and conflict, may I hope, cease and peace, sympathy and love reign among men. And I, in common with my people, pray that the blessings of God may rest on you and your labours. When the addresses had been read, the Swami left the hall and mounted to the box seat of a carriage in waiting. Owing to the intense enthusiasm of the large crowd assembled to welcome him, the Swami was only able to make the following short reply, postponing his reply proper to a future occasion. Man proposes and God disposes. It was proposed that the addresses and the replies should be carried in the English fashion. But here, God disposes. I am speaking to a scattered audience from a chariot in the Gita fashion. Thankful we are, therefore, that it should have happened so. It gives a zest to the speech and strength to what I am going to tell you. I do not know whether my voice will reach all of you, but I will try my best. I never before had an opportunity of addressing a large open-air meeting. The wonderful kindness, the fervent and enthusiastic joy with which I have been received from Colombo to Madras and seem likely to be received all over India have passed even my most sanguine expectations. But that only makes me glad, for it proves the assertion which I have made again and again in the past, that as each nation has one ideal as its vitality, as each nation has one particular groove which is to become its own, so religion is the peculiarity of the growth of the Indian mind. In other parts of the world, religion is one of the many considerations. In fact, it is a minor occupation. In England, for instance, Religion is part of the national policy. The English church belongs to the ruling class and as such, whether they believe in it or not, they all support it, thinking that it is their church. Every gentleman and every lady is expected to belong to that church. It is a sign of gentility. So with other countries, there is a great national power. Either it is represented by politics or it is represented by some intellectual pursuits. Either it is represented by militarism or by commercialism. There the heart of the nation beats, and religion is one of the many secondary ornamental things which that nation possesses. Here in India, it is religion that forms the very core of the national heart. It is the backbone, the bedrock, the foundation upon which the national edifice has been built. Politics, power, and even intellect form a secondary consideration here. Religion, therefore, is the one consideration in India. I have been told a hundred times of the want of information there is among the masses of the Indian people. And that is true. Landing in Colombo, I found not one of them had heard of the political upheavals going on in Europe, the changes, the downfall of ministries and so forth. Not one of them had heard of what is meant by socialism and anarchism and of this and that change in the political atmosphere of Europe but that there was a sannyasin from India sent over to the parliament of religions and that he had achieved some sort of success had become known to every man, woman and child in Ceylon. It proves that there is no lack of information, nor lack of desire for information where it is of the character that suits them, when it falls in line with the necessities of their life. Politics and all these things never formed a necessity of Indian life. But religion and spirituality have been the one condition upon which it lived and thrived and has got to live in the future. Two great problems are being decided by the nations of the world. India has taken up one side and the rest of the world has taken the other side. And the problem is this, who is to survive? What makes one nation survive and the others die? Should love survive or hatred? Should enjoyment survive or renunciation? Should matter survive or the spirit? 
in the struggle of life. We think as our ancestors did, a way back in prehistoric ages, where even tradition cannot pierce the gloom of that past. There our glorious ancestors have taken up their side of the problem and have thrown the challenge to the world. Our solution is renunciation, giving up, fearlessness and love. These are the fittest to survive. Giving up the senses makes a nation survive. As a proof of this, here is history today telling us of mushroom nations, rising and falling almost every century, starting up from nothingness, making vicious play for a few days and then melting. This big, gigantic race, which had to grapple with some of the greatest problems of misfortunes, dangers and vicissitudes, such as never fell upon the head of any other nation of the world, survives because it has taken the side of renunciation. For without renunciation, how can there be religion? Europe is trying to solve the other side of the problem as to how much a man can have, how much more power a man can possess by hook or by crook, by some means or other. Competition, cruel, cold and heartless, is the law of Europe. Our law is caste, the breaking of competition, checking its forces, mitigating its cruelties, smoothing the passage of the human soul through this mystery of life. At this stage, the crowd became so unmanageable that the Swami could not make himself heard to advantage. He therefore ended his address with these words. Friends, I am very much pleased with your enthusiasm. It is marvellous. Do not think that I am displeased with you at all. I am, on the other hand, intensely pleased at the show of enthusiasm. That is what is required. Tremendous enthusiasm. Only make it permanent. Keep it up. Let not the fire die out. We want to work out great things in India. For that I require your help. Such enthusiasm is necessary. It is impossible to hold this meeting any longer. I thank you very much for your kindness and enthusiastic welcome. In calm moments we shall have better thoughts and ideas to exchange. Now for the time, my friends, goodbye. It is impossible to address you on all sides. Therefore you must content yourselves this evening with merely seeing me. I will reserve my speech for some other occasion. I thank you very much for your enthusiastic welcome.